Good morning. I'm David Lebron, president of Rice University, and we'd like to welcome all of you to the Baker Institute and this event. Rice has extended invitations to each of the remaining candidates for President of the United States. Today's speaker is the first of those candidates to have accepted our invitation. The format today will be that our speaker will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes, and the remaining time will be open for questions taken directly from the audience. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Secretary James Baker, who will then welcome our speaker. As you know, Secretary Baker was the 67th Secretary of the Treasury under President Ronald Reagan, the 61st Secretary of State under President Bush, and most importantly, our Honorary Chair of the Baker Institute and the inspiration and vision behind that institute. Our university today would not be the international force it is without the Baker Institute. We're extremely grateful for Secretary Baker's continued involvement and his participation today. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Baker. Thank you very much, President Lieber, and thank you for that introduction and for your dedication to Rice University. Thank you as well for helping uh, to bring about this uh, town hall forum and to bring it to our campus. I also want to extend my thanks to Ambassador Ed Derigian, the founding director of the Baker Institute, and his entire staff for their contribution to this event. Unfortunately, uh, Ed is out of the country and couldn't join us today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real pleasure and privilege today to introduce to you someone that I have known and worked with and admired for a very long time. Our speaker was born in 1936, the child of a family dedicated to military service. Both his father and grandfather later became admirals in the Navy. He himself graduated from the Naval Academy in 1958. Roughly six months after his deployment to Vietnam in 1967, his plane was shot down over North Vietnam during his 23rd bombing mission. That was just the beginning of his heroic tale. He became a prisoner of war at the so-called Hanoi Hilton, where he was beaten daily for withholding information. His captors offered him an early release, but he refused, rather than see comrades who'd been captured earlier than he forced to stay longer. Five and a half years after being captured, he was released and he returned to the United States. By 1982, he had married, retired from the Navy as a captain, and been elected as a U.S. congressman from Arizona. Five years later, he was sworn in as one of his state's United States senators. During his two decades in Washington, our speaker gained a reputation for tackling some of the most difficult and contentious issues of our day, from, com from campaign finance reform to border security. He is well known as a consensus builder who can work both sides of the aisle. Today, he's the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Armed Services. He's the ranking member and former chairman of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. And he's a member and former chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. In my view, he is also the presumptive Republican nominee for president of the United States. In short, our speaker is eminently qualified by experience and expertise to offer us his patented brand of straight talk. His presence here today is a distinct honor for Rice University and for the Baker Institute, and a distinct personal pleasure for me as well. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present to you the senior United States Senator from the state of Arizona, the Honorable John McLean. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for those kind words of introduction. Thank all of you for being here this morning. And I know that uh, you, as uh, 
President LeBron said, I will, we will like to do what I, we have been doing for years now and probably one of the major ingre ingredients in bringing us to where we are in this campaign, and that's the town hall meeting, where people have a chance uh, after mercifully few minutes of listening to me to uh, giving me their questions and comments and occasional insult and uh, have a dialogue. Uh, that's what really what I think is the essence of American politics. Um, I had 101 town hall meetings in the state of New Hampshire during this primary season. And before I move forward, I again would like to thank Secretary Baker and Susan, uh, the many years of service to this nation, uh, beginning with uh, Secretary Baker's service in the United States Marine Corps. Um, I'm grateful for his friendship, and I continue to be grateful for the leadership and policy decisions and recommendations and information that's provided to all the people of this country, including the Congress and the executive branch by the Baker Institute for Public uh, Policy. Um, my dear friend Bob Mossbacker and his wife Mika are here. Um, as many of you know, Bob Mossbacker was uh, one of the leading members of the Coolidge administration, and so uh, we, uh, we are very happy to be here. Ace, Asa Hutchinson, uh, my old friend, former congressman and great leader and a great person is here. Thank you, Asa. Elizabeth Ann Jones, our great member of the Railroad Commission, and uh, all of you who are here this morning, I'd like to say thank you and thank you for turning out. And I'd like to begin by on the issue of, uh, of uh, being president of the United States. May I say I ask your sympathy for the families of the state of Arizona because Barry Goldwater from Arizona ran for President of the United States, and Morris Udall from Arizona ran for President of the United States, and Bruce Babbitt from Arizona ran for President of the United States. I from Arizona ran for President of the United States, and Arizona may be the only state in America where mothers don't tell their children that someday they can grow up and be President <laughs> of the United States. Um, Thank you very much. I believe that climate change is real, I think it's taking place. I'll be glad to continue the debate on whether it is or not, but the overwhelming majority of, of, of uh, scientific opinion clearly indicates that greenhouse gas emissions are harming our planet, and if we don't bring it under control, we will have serious consequences from it. So I'd like to put the question to you this way. Suppose that we who believe that climate change is taking place are wrong, and we go ahead and develop these green technologies, whether it be hybrid cars, whether it be hydrogen, whether it be flex fuels, whether it be nuclear power, whether it be sun, tide, solar, uh, solar tide, all of the, 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 the ways of, of generating power and eliminating and reducing and eventually eliminating greenhouse gases. Suppose that we uh, do that. All we've done is given our children and grandchildren a cleaner planet. But, but suppose we are right and do nothing. Suppose we are correct, as is the majority of scientific opinion, that greenhouse gases are causing significant and severe damage to the climate of our planet, and we do nothing. Obviously, I think uh, uh, the way I put the question to you, that the answer is obvious. So we really need to, uh, to I believe, make the American people aware of what stake is at stake here with the nexus of these two, I think, compelling issues for the 21st century. And I have, by the way, nuclear power, nuclear power has got to be part of any equation that we are, if we're really serious about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I would remind you that the French, uh, you know, we always like to imitate the French. The French, 80% of their electricity is generated by nuclear power. And by the way, in case you missed it, we now have a pro-American president of France, which shows if you live long enough, anything is possible uh, in this world. So, so we have a nexus uh, of two, I think, compelling challenges. And anybody that doesn't believe that the United States of America doesn't have the entrepreneurial, technological, innovative base to address this problem does not know America. And, and I'm convinced that we can develop a battery that will take a car 100 miles. If you've got an automobile uh, in most parts of America where you can go 100 miles before you have to plug it in, I think Americans are going to buy it. I think that flex fuels, as with Brazilians have proven, that you can go to E85. 
It's not as if we are reinventing the wheel in many respects, but we've got to do it, and it's a major challenge from a national security standpoint as well as uh, what we are doing to our planet. And right here, right here in this state, there's probably more talent and innovation as there is in any place in America, at the academic level as well as the industrial level. So I'm confident, but we've got to, we've got to, uh, we've got to arouse the American people, and I know the American people will meet that challenge. We're, we're facing some difficult economic times. We all know that. And some parts of America are in more difficulty than others. I just came down from Ohio and the manufacturing heartland of America has got some really big problems. People's having their home, people having their homes foreclosed and losing their homes. We've seen these manufacturing layoffs that are, that are uh, very large, very, very large layoffs as we see the automobile industry downsize and we see other manufacturing jobs leaving America. I'd like to want to look you in the eye right now, my friends, uh, because I think straight talk is important for anybody who wants to lead this country. I believe in free trade. I believe in free trade, and I believe that anyone who studies history understands that every time this country or other nations in the world have practiced protectionism, they've paid a very, very heavy price for it. In fact, some would argue that one of the major contributors to World War II was the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Acts of the 1930s. So. Look, uh, the 1920s, I believe it was, it was passed. And so uh, I, I'm a free trader. I believe that NAFTA has created jobs. And I think it's been for good for our economy. I think it's been good for the Canadian economy. And I think it's been good for the Mexican economy. Are there inequities? Is there, is there every, did everything go perfectly well? Of course not. And, uh, and we have problems with some of our trading partners. But the fact is, that I believe that we should continue to seek free trade agreements. And by the way, I would have as one of my highest priorities the, free, the pending free trade agreement between the United States and Colombia. My friends, the Colombians are helping us and are very important in this battle against drugs coming into this country across the Arizona-Mexico border and across the Texas-Mexican uh, border. So I believe in free trade, and of course we want the balanced trade. Of course we want other nations to respect our intellectual property rights. The next time that uh, President of the United States, the next time a toy that came into this country from China that was going to harm the health of our children, that'd be the last toy that came in from China into this country until they fixed it. But we, I, I believe in free trade, and I think that that may be one of the many differences between myself and whoever the nominee of the Democratic uh, Party is. And I think that um, we have to uh, address this compelling issue of workers who have been displaced. My friends, uh, the, worker, the programs that we have for displaced workers in America were designed for the 1950s. When, when an economic downturn took place, people would be laid off, and then the economy would return, and they'd get the same old job back. Those old jobs are not coming back. New jobs are going to be created. But those new jobs are going to require educated and trained workers. And the best place, and the present programs don't do it. And we need to go to the community colleges, the base of our education system in America, and have them design and implement training, job training and education, education programs so that we can make these workers capable of reentering the workforce in the information technology revolution that we are in. We are in. This nation and the world are in a fundamental change. The only comparison I can make to it was the Industrial Revolution. When we went from an agrarian economy uh, to an industrial one, now we're going from an industrial-based economy to a high-tech one, as you all know. And so we've got to have the training and education programs. We also have to continue improving education in America. But immediately in states like Ohio and Michigan, parts of Illinois, parts of Pennsylvania and others, we've got people who unfortunately are seeing the end of their working lives at a very early age. We can't do that. That's not America. We're, we're, we're a nation that takes care of all of our citizens as well as we can. Of course we need to cut taxes. We need to make the, the tax cuts permanent. If we don't, then the American family and business will experience a tax increase. That's the worst thing I think any economist will tell you that can happen to uh, a country at a time of economic difficulties. I'm not sure how many even people in this room uh, recognize the fact that the United States of America has the second highest corporate tax rate in the world.
Only the Japanese have a higher tax, corporate tax rate than the United States of America. We need to cut the corporate tax rate. One of the reasons why corporations and businesses leave and jobs leave America is because they go places where they pay lower taxes. We need to, we need to lower our corporate tax rates. There's an enemy out there called the alternate minimum tax. Somebody had the great idea some years ago that we were going to make sure that the very richest people in America didn't get off without paying taxes. Well, as inflation has gone up, that has creeped down, and now 25 million American families can be subject to what is now turning into a two-tier tax system. We have to eliminate this so-called alternate minimum tax. And by the way, I notice that my Democrat friends are saying they're only going to tax, increase taxes on the rich. Well, my friends, <clears throat> a lot of people may find themselves astonished to find themselves in that category according to that description. I'm not going to raise anybody's taxes. This is the worst time that we could raise people's taxes. We want to stimulate our economy. We want the consumers back working, and we've got to stop out-of-control spending. And that out-of-control spending, my friends, in a little straight talk, was the reason why the Republicans lost the election in 2006. We dispirited and de-energized our base. And, uh, I, 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 and, and we paid a very heavy price for it. Uh, in the last two years, the President of the United States signed into law two massive spending bills. There was $35 billion worth of earmarked uh, projects on it, $35 billion, uh, ranging from the outrageous, such as the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. We all know about the bridge of a uh, $233 million bridge to an island in Alaska with 50 people on it to, uh, well, one of them was, uh, my favorite was uh, $3 million to study the DNA of bears in Montana. I don't know if that was a paternity issue or a criminal issue. <laughs> But, uh, uh, and I, I think, I think uh, Jim remembers that Ronald Reagan used to say, uh, uh, Congress spends money like a drunken sailor, only he never, knew a drunken, he never knew a sailor drunk or sober with the imagination of members of Congress. And that's kind of a funny line, and I use it all the time. I've stolen a lot of lines from Ronald Reagan, by the way. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I use it so much that I'm not making this up when I tell you about six months ago, I received an email from a guy that said, as a former drunken sailor, I resent being compared to members of Congress. <laughs> you, know, you can't blame the guy at all. I've never asked for an earmark or pork barrel project, my friends. I've never asked nor received one, and my state is doing pretty well. Senator Clinton got 300 and some million dollars worth of earmark projects last year. According to objective calculations, Senator Obama got some 32 million, as, as I understand, millions of dollars. And Senator Obama, who believes in transparency, says that he won't reveal the earmarks for the two years before that. My friends, uh, this, this, is a, this is another one of these issues. If we're going to continue down this path of earmarking and pork barrel projects, then uh, obviously the American voter will not trust in us. That $35 billion if, uh, that I mentioned to you in pork barrel earmark projects would have translated into a $1,000 tax credit for every child in America. That, that puts it, I think, into the kind of perspective that we need to put it in. So it's going to stop. As President of the United States, the first earmark bill that comes across my desk, I'll veto it. Now, if they want to try to override the veto, that, they're right to do that. But I'll go to the American people, and I'm sure the American people will side with me to eliminate this practice that they've grown very, very weary of. I'd like to mention to you two quick subjects very briefly. One, veterans' health care. Um, I carry around with me all the time a, a card that, I, that has a quote from George Washington in 1789, and I think it's important. He said in 1789, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional as to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their country. And uh, my friends... Um, we know that there is a lot of serious wounds from this war. We know that it's been a long and tough war, and a lot of sacrifices have been made. The wounds, uh, the PTSD that needs treatment, the wounds from the IEDs, we all know that. And we need to expand the military capability at places like Brook Army Hospital, and we need to also expand our VA. But our VA, uh, our veterans now today, quite often, with a routine health care need, go to 
a uh, hospital, I mean, go to the VA facility and they stand in line to get an appointment to stand in line. We can't do that anymore. We're going to have to give them for a routine health care requirement a plastic card, and they can take that card to any health care provider or doctor of their choice and get a routine health care need taken care of. That's what we owe our veterans, and uh, I intend to see that that happens for the obvious reasons that George Washington stated back in 1789. Finally, I'd like to mention to you about the war in Iraq. You may have noticed in the debate the other night, uh, which I did not watch, that Senator Obama... Senator Obama stated that um, he uh, would, if al-Qaeda was establishing a base in Iraq after we left Iraq, as he wants us to do immediately, then he would consider going back to Iraq. Uh, I, I uh, responded to that by saying, um, well, they are in Iraq. <laughs> They're called al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so... Uh, uh, so let me get this right. Senator Obama wants to leave immediately from Iraq, but if al-Qaeda is in Iraq, then he would consider going back. Obviously, that's, that, that's not logical. In fact, we are succeeding in Iraq, something that both he and Senator Clinton refused to acknowledge. We are succeeding militarily, and we are succeeding uh, politically. So yesterday, Senator Obama said, well, we shouldn't have gone in in the first place, and if we hadn't gone in the first place, we wouldn't be facing this problem. Well, uh, that's, that's history. That's the past. That's, that's talking about what happened before. What we should be talking about is what we're going to do now. And what we're going to do now is continue this strategy, which is succeeding in Iraq, and we are carrying out uh, the goals of the surge. The Iraqi military are taking over more and more responsibilities. The, the casualties are down, and we will be able to withdraw and come home, but that we will come home with honor. And if we do what Senator Clinton and Senator Obama want, and that's declare a date for withdrawal, then al-Qaeda will tell the world that they defeated the United States of America, and we will be fighting again in that region and in the rest of the world, and they will follow us home. And that's not my idea, that's theirs, if you read what bin Laden and, uh, and many of the others, are, are Zawahiri and all the others, are saying. There's a lot at stake here, my friends. There's a great deal at stake here in our nation's security. And I've been involved in major, every major national security issue for the, 20, for the last 20 years. I believe I have the experience and the knowledge and the judgment uh, to lead this country. And the issue of Iraq, as you know, that uh, it wasn't very popular to, por to support the surge some time ago. And many pundits said that I was through. And my friends, at the time when I was told that, I said I would much rather lose a political campaign than lose a war, and I feel that way today. And I would be glad to engage in this debate, not only on Iraq, but how we confront this transcendent evil of the 21st century, which is radical Islamic extremism. And I don't want to go on, but I just, sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend how evil these people are. You may have seen a week or so ago that, uh, that Al-Qaeda uh, took two mentally disabled women, put explosive vests on them, sent them into a marketplace, and by remote control detonated those explosive vests, killing them and people around them. How evil is that? And if, you think, and if they do that to their own young women, what do you think they would do to our children and our family members? This is, this is a transcendent challenge, and it has many manifestations. And it's military, and it's economic, and it's diplomatic, and it's intelligence. And Osama bin Laden will be my first target because we have to remove him, and I'll get him. And so finally, could I just say that um, I'm proud of America. America is divided about this war, and clearly... We are divided and we've been frustrated by it and saddened by the sacrifice that's been made. But I'm happy, I thank God every day, that no American is divided in our support of the brave young Americans who are serving in uniform in the military today. And I know you share that view. So I'd like to close by re telling you about an incident that happened to me uh, that puts everything in the proper priority and in the proper uh, way that we should address the challenges that face us uh, in politics or in our lives. And this one happened uh, last August in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Uh, there was a town hall meeting. A woman stood up and said, Senator McCain, I want you to do me, would you do me the honor of wearing a bracelet with my son's name on it, Matthew Stanley? Matthew Stanley was 22 years old. He was killed in combat outside of Baghdad just before Christmas last year. I said I would be honored uh, to wear this bracelet. And then she said, I want you to promise me one thing. I want you to promise me you'll do everything in your power 
to make sure that my son's death was not in vain. I take her charge very seriously and every other family member, and I am confident that I have the ability to inspire a generation of Americans to serve a cause greater than their own self-interest, and that is the most noble cause that one can engage in. America's greatest days are ahead of us. And I would like to remind you there was a time when Secretary Baker was around when America, many Americans thought that the, our best days were behind us. And a guy came out of California and he believed that our best days were ahead of us. He believed the Berlin Wall would come down. He believed that we would prevail and he, re, and he renewed our energy, he renewed our faith, he renewed our confidence, he rebuilt our military and obviously won the Cold War in the words of Margaret Thatcher without firing a shot. My friends, I believe America's best days are ahead of us, and I believe we will remain in the 21st century, as Ronald Reagan used to say, a shining city on a hill. Thank you for having me today. And thank you for your attendance, and I look forward to answering your questions or comments. Sir. Senator, McC is that Senator McCain, if you would, um, I'm interested in hearing um, how you think you can court the far right while remaining true to the moderates and independents that have so far defined your political career. Well, I think we're doing um, a pretty good job there. I think that um, we all know that primaries are very tough. Primaries pit friends against friends. And sometimes they're more difficult emotionally, frankly, than, than the general election is. And I'll be, try to be brief because I see a number of questioners, but uh, we are getting a larger and larger percentage of the vote in each primary of, of Republicans that call themselves conservative. I was pleased to have the endorsement of Pastor John Hagee yesterday. A lot of people are coming in our direction. But let me also say I need to unite the party. I need to energize the party. I need to energize the party as well as unite it. We're going to have to reach out to independents and obviously find those Reagan Democrats that were so great to us in past elections. So uh, I understand the challenge, but I have to uh, secure the nomination first, and that's very important. But I believe that I can do it, and I believe that we will be united because I think there will be very stark differences between my philosophy and that of either Senator Obama or Senator Clinton. They want to raise your taxes, I want to lower them. They want government to take over health care, I want families to make the choices. Obviously, I just outlined national security differences, and that will be a respectful debate. I commit to a respectful debate, uh, but it will also be a very spirited one, and Americans will have choices, and I hope that will rally our base as well. I know we have to energize our base, but I'm also pleased to see yesterday and today, yesterday and the day before, there are a number of polls that show me ahead in a general election matchup between myself and either one of them. But we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yes. Um, that's uh, another issue that has arisen. Thank you. Um, Back about a year ago, uh, I was asked if I would take public financing for the general election. According to the law, the day that the, nom the candidate is nominated, they are eligible for public financing. In this case, it would be about $85 million. I said at that time, if the Democrat nominee was, uh, would agree to public financing, that I would also take that for the general election. Senator Obama at that time committed to taking public financing if he and I were the nominees. Uh, and he signed a piece of paper that said he would. Well, now Senator Obama and his advisors clearly are uh, backing off of that commitment. They want certain agreements or certain negotiations, which would never happen. Uh, and so I'm going to keep my commitment, and that is that I will take public financing after I'm in the general election, and I hope that if Senator Obama will, and I hope he will keep his commitment as well. So far, it looks like he may not. Thank you. Yes. Senator McCain, uh, first I would like to thank you for honoring us with your visit to the Baker Institute and thank also you. for your uh, service of many years to the country. Um, thank you. I feel like...
One of the main issues of this election is the uh, future for Iraq. And I was wanting to know what your strategy was to end the sectarian divide and violence in Iraq, um, get the Sunnis, Shiites, and Kurds to work together in building a stable government, um, and what the future of uh, Iraq uh, what the neighbors of Iraq's future is with um, Iraq and helping build stability, and also if you had considered Joe Biden's plan and uh, what your thoughts and beliefs were about that. As you know, Joe Biden's plan is that you basically divide them up into three countries. I, I think that has kind of lost as we have, as the surge has succeeded and we see some political progress, and I say some, um, that, that theory has lost some of its um, momentum, as you know. Uh, I believe that, I've got to give you a straight talk, the toughest thing that we need to make the most progress in Iraq right now is rule of law. The, the rule of law, as we all know, is the hardest thing part of democracy. We can have elections every day and you can see people hold their finger up with that they've had the ink on and can have election after election. But the rule of law is really the hardest part. The number one, the number one target of al-Qaeda today in Iraq are judges. That's, that, that's their number one objective, and obviously when you think about it, you can understand it. And one of the big problems, and they just passed a law for Sunni, Sunni amnesty, is that we've got 20,000 Sunni that have been on, in indefinite, indefinite detention uh, in prisons in Iraq. And you can't do that. You can't do that. Every citizen of a country has got to be entitled to some judicial uh, process. Um, they are making progress. They just passed three laws, and then one of them was vetoed. So it's, in, as always in Iraq, it's two step forwards and one step back. They passed a budget. By the way, my dear friends, in case you hadn't noticed, in our nation's capital, we haven't passed a budget. So the Iraqis are one step ahead of us, at, at least there. Uh, but, I, I, look, I think it's long and it's hard and it's tough. There's no Thomas Jeffersons in Iraq. Any time there was anybody who showed any independence for many, many years, Saddam Hussein chopped their head off. And so it's hard. But, and, and I think there's a couple of tests coming up. One of them is Kirkut. As you know, uh, Saddam Hussein moved a whole bunch of people, Arabs, into the area and moved the Kurds out. Now the Kurds are back in. But they have, they've kind of made a little progress on that that surprises everybody. Mosul, we are seeing uh, a test of the Iraqi military because it's going to be the Iraqi military that goes in there with support from the United States as they try to clean out that last bastion uh, or one of the last bastions of, of, uh, of al-Qaeda's control over an area. I think it's hard. I think it's a hard slog. But no one, even the most optimistic of us, predicted the progress that has been made over the last year by the surge when you look at the, at the progress they've been, that they have made. So all I can say is that the whole scheme of things is the classic counterinsurgency. It's not a new theory. It's an old one that we've used successfully and unsuccessfully, and that is the Iraqi military and police take over more and more of the responsibilities. The sectarian violence is way down. The attacks on the pilgrims at Karbala have still been going on, but they're dramatically reduced. So uh, I, I think that if we continue this progress, and I think we are, then you will see Americans withdraw to enclaves and then gradually withdraw. And then we decide, after the war, then we decide the issue of American presence. After the first Gulf War, thanks to Secretary Baker and others, we negotiated a military base agreement with Kuwait. That's, we have one there. We have a base in Turkey. We have troops in South Korea. So military presence may remain for years. It may not. It may be like the Saudis. And the Saudis decide they don't want any American military presence there. But that is after we succeed in the war. Uh, and I think Americans... We'll show, we'll show them more patience if we can show them success, if we show them success. But I understand their frustration. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator McCain, I, before I ask my question, I just wanted to thank you as a liberal Democrat for your principled, controversial stance on campaign finance reform and uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And thank for you. your apologies about the uh, Obama comments yesterday. Thank and, you. Um, my question Thank is you. related. I, I would like to mention again, this has got to be a respectful campaign. Americans want that. They want that today. Go ahead. But, I, had, I, but I worry about the 527s, which is another subject, but go ahead. I had my questions related to Iraq. You talked about how, uh, how al-Qaeda could set up a base in Iraq, 
But since Al Qaeda is like Wahhabis that hate Shia and consider them heretics, how could they really potentially set up a base in a nation that is 60% Shia? Well, let me let me just say that uh, my I agree with General Petraeus. General Petraeus says that. Iraq is now the central battleground against radical Islamic extremism. The greatest instrument of that and the most influential one is al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is in Iraq today. They're called al-Qaeda in Iraq, as you know. And they're the greatest enemy that we are the strongest enemy that we are facing. They also receive an infusion from other countries, as you well know, who that they recruit. And one of our great dangers in Afghanistan is the return of the Taliban, which then means that if they have safe areas, al-Qaeda could do as they did before and set up training camps. So I guess we just have a fundamental disagreement. Al-Qaeda is there. They are active. They are our greatest enemy. There are other problems, the Badr Brigades, the Mahdi Army, the al sadrs people, all of that. By the way, I'm, I was pleased to see al Sadr uh, decide to extend the, uh, quote, ceasefire. I think that is a sign of many things, including progress. But al-Qaeda is there. They are functioning. They are supported in many, time, in many ways by the Iranians, even though there is uh, differences there. They, they feel they have a common enemy. And by the way, back to that previous question, I still have not seen, even though you hear reports to contrary, that there has been a cessation or reduction of Iranian movement of people and most importantly these lethal, most lethal explosive devices across the Iranian border. And there are still suicide bombers landing at the Damascus airport and coming across as well. But did you want to respond to that, please? This is, this is a town hall meeting, so go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I think your response was fine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> in, the, in this format, you are allowed to, to disagree, agree, disagree. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator McCain, first I'd like to thank you for uh, giving us Rice students such a tremendous opportunity and an incentive to get out of bed before the sun this morning. Um, <laughs> thank yeah. you. Uh, you and Senator Barack Obama despite being opposed on a great many issues, share a wish, a wish to see Guantanamo Bay closed as soon as possible. I would like to use this opportunity to ask if you would take a pledge, hopefully to be matched by Senator Obama, committing to closing the facility within your first 500 days in office. Which one? I'm sorry. I'm sorry? I, oh, yeah. I think Guantanamo should be closed. Uh, I think it's become a symbol, and I would move those... Uh, detainees to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where we have a federal prison. But I also would accelerate this process of a judicial process. And I do not mean a trial that is the kind we have to or for American citizens. I mean the kind of tribunal or system such as we did after World War II, Nuremberg, or a, a system such as that, so that we can move forward with those cases. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Possibly the age becoming an issue, your mother living in 96. Would you 96. tell the Americans your energy level, please? Yes, sir. By the way, I was glad that, uh, to see that Mr. Nader is in the race. He's older than I am, so I was glad, <laughs> pleased to, to note that. Uh, my mother is uh, 96. Uh, she uh, lived a wonderful life as a dedicated Navy wife to my father and traveled and is very interesting and last Christmas she wanted to travel around, drive around France and so she flew to Paris and tried to rent a car. They said she was too old so she bought a car and drove around <laughs> France. So she's doing just fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator McCain, for coming out here. And I just want to ask you, um, Historians often attribute Lincoln's great success as a national leader uh, to his willingness to listen to all sides, namely his allies and his enemies. Will you as president seek counsel from advisors that come from both sides, uh, Democrats and Republicans, when selecting cabinet members and be willing to face criticism from your closest advisors uh, uh, in leading this country, especially in regards to Iraq? I would, and I will, and I do. Um, I think one of the most, I study history as well and study presidencies. And sometimes presidents, and I think Jim 
Secretary Baker would agree with this, and also Secretary Mossbacker, and Asa Hutchison would too. Sometimes the bubble gets smaller and smaller, particularly when a president feels beleaguered. And that's the time when you have a circle of advisors and friends who are somewhat like peers. There's no such thing as a peer of a president, but there certainly is people who you've known and worked with and had uh, information and advice from and counsel and discussion with for many, many years. And you pick up the phone and you call them or you ask them to come down and sit down and, at a table and hash these things out. And I think there are people, frankly, like Secretary Baker, Henry Kissinger, Brent Scowcroft. There's many people, um, uh, Zbig Brzezinski, uh, many others that uh, would not be in any way, you're always a little constrained, but would not be totally constrained to have a little straight talk with the President of the United States. Uh, so yes, I would do that. And probably the first guy I would call would be Joe Lieberman. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Senator, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about immigration reform. Previously, you said that you support a comprehensive immigration plan that would um, secure the borders to prevent the spread of illegal immigration, that would provide opportunities for people to enter this country legally, and would begin a legalization process that would end the underground labor market that hurts both American workers who lose their jobs and illegal immigrants who are forced into horrible living conditions. More recently, you said that you think our priority has to be securing the border. I was wondering, do you still believe comprehensive immigration reform is possible? And if not, what alternative policies do you propose? I do believe it's possible. But as you noticed, um, and I noticed, <laughs> we failed. We failed. And the lesson is that Americans want the border secured first. Now, there's a logic to that. And that logic is that in 1986, we did pass a law where we said we'd secure the borders and we gave, quote, amnesty to a couple of million people. And we didn't secure the borders and we ended up with 12 million people who are in this country illegally. So Americans want to be assured that whatever steps we make, like a temporary worker program that would be associated with tamper-proof biometric documents and uh, addressing the issue of the people who are here illegally, they don't want to have to revisit the, pro the, the situation all over again because we haven't secured our borders. So I, I still believe we need to have a temporary worker program that's viable, and I still believe that we have to address the issue not having anyone rewarded for illegal behavior over those who came here legally or waited to come here legally, but we have to secure the borders first. They're doing a lot of things here in the state of Texas. They're doing a lot of things in Arizona and California, and I believe we can secure the borders, particularly we're using a lot of high tech, but Americans just, they want that. I think we can do it. And I understand that 40% of the people who are here illegally came with visas that were valid and lapsed, but there is a symbolism out there of broken borders with the, associated with the drugs, associated with a lot of the bad things that are happening on our border that where they want fixed as well. So I still favor a comprehensive solution, but the, the American people want the border secured first. I believe we must do that. I would have the border state governor certify that their borders are secure, and then we move on to the other parts of the of the solution. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator McCain, for coming today. Um, as you know, we are the leading CO2 producer in the world, and we have still not yet We're about to be CO2. passed up by China, too. <laughs> I, I was about know. to say, my yeah. next comment was that China, the world's second largest um, producer of CO2, has also not ratified the treaty. Uh, so as president, how would you help lead the front against greenhouse gases and the dependence on foreign energy without sacrificing progress? And what would you say to countries like China to get on board? I'd say to countries like China, by the way, there are pollution from China that are, it's, it's affecting California today. Uh, I would say to China and India, you have to join this. We have to have India and China, the two largest, grow fastest growing economies in the world, as part of any global agreement. And some people say, well, they wouldn't do it. Well, why not? I mean, just to say they wouldn't do it, that, that's not uh, uh, correct. I mean, just because they say they won't, uh, it seems to me that, that there's a lot of pressures we can bring to bear. So, yes, I would have to have India and China. But I, I, I don't believe it's going to cost us money. I don't believe I – I think there's a reason why General Electric, the world's largest corporation, announced that they're dedicated to green technologies because they're going to continue to make a profit, and they do make a profit. 
when, when you know this cap and trade idea that Senator Lieberman and I have, that if a company or a corporation or a business reduces their greenhouse gases, they earn a credit and they can sell that, et cetera, et cetera. People say it's going to cost. Well, how? Why? I mean, when, when you look at the entrepreneurial, innovative, technological capabilities of this nation, it seems to me energy-saving devices, green technology, will save us money. It will reduce our expenses. It will help American families. I have an abiding faith in our ability to develop technologies that are not only green, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but are also good for our economy. And other people, this kind of status... I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand the argument that says that we will not be able to make this a booming business. I mean, look at even some of the hybrid cars now that are already selling uh, very well and they're very expensive. You bring those costs down, you get a battery that'll take a car 100 miles, people, it'll be, in the long run, it'll be not only less expensive, but more profit-making and better for our economy. So I have an abiding faith in the, in the entrepreneurial and technological and innovative base of America that, that we can do it, and, and, I'm, and I'm confident that we will. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Senator, I'm very concerned about the fact that most of the civilized world does not view the United States as a very nice place. I'm a veteran of World War II, and I was a Marine officer who interrogated prisoners at Guam and Iwo Jima. What will you do, and but, but incidentally, we were never given even an hour's training on how to treat a prisoner. What will you do to restore the American position in the world where people honor us and want to be like us? Well, thank you, sir. I, I, I very briefly, thank you for your service to our country. I, I'm very grateful. First of all, I, I think we ought to understand one of the realities, and that is that when the threat of the, of the then Soviet Union disappeared, uh, some of the glue that kept the alliance together uh, was gone. And so, therefore, you see less sort of, uh, sort of cohesion within the traditional Atlantic alliance. But I see this new president of France who's pro-American. We have great relations with Chancellor Merkel of Germany. Uh, our, our relations with, with the British will always be a unique relationship. The Polish government, the former, quote, Eastern European countries we are friends with. And, and so I, I don't think it's as bleak as, as some portray our relations with a lot of countries in the world. But having said that, I would certainly announce that we will never... Uh, torture a prisoner or anyone in American custody ever again. We will not do that. That's just not that's something that, that the United States of America should do. And since you were there, you may recall that we tried and convicted and hung Japanese war criminals, and one of the charges against them was that they waterboarded Americans. I mean, uh, and so... Uh, I would be glad to go into all of the, the problems, but there is the Geneva Conventions of treatment of detainees and prisoners, and the reason why we signed it was because we wanted to protect our military men and women if they fall into the hands of the enemy, and uh, we cannot do that. Uh, and so, let, no, could I just mention one thing very interesting? I, I was met uh, over Thanksgiving, I was in Iraq, and I met with, it was arranged for me, with a former high-ranking member of Al-Qaeda. And this guy was one tough guy, and he had come over to our side. I said, how did you succeed so well after the initial military invasion? He said two things. He said two things was what caused our success. One was the lawlessness. You didn't have enough boots on the ground, and everything just, as you know, there was total lawlessness. They stripped the infrastructure. There was murder. There was, you know, it was a total lawless situation. He said that's what helped us. And he said the second was our greatest recruiting tool was Abu Ghraib. We should pay attention uh, to what the Al-Qaeda member said was their greatest recruiting tool, and we should make sure it never happens again. Uh, could I answer this one young lady first, uh, Jim, because she's been very patient, and then I'm afraid we'll have to, have to depart, and, uh, and I won't be able to respond to any more of your questions, but we'll be back here. We'll be back. 
Yes, please. Thank you for your comments and your service to our country. Um, you've previously stated that we'll stay in Iraq as long as we need to be there, be it 10, 20, or 100 years. Well, on the campaign trail for Hillary Clinton, uh, former President Bill Clinton has repeatedly used the following analogy. He says that if your neighbor's house burns down, you might let them come and sleep on your couch for, say, a week, a month, maybe even six months. But after a year, it's not about the fire anymore. So my question is, with Iraq, when will it not be about the fire anymore? If we don't have a yearly time point or a plan for withdrawal, how long will we allow the Iraqis to sleep on the American couch and use the American resources? What will well, be our benchmark? Well, if, the, if our house is being in danger of being burned down, then we will do whatever is necessary to prevent them from burning our, down our house, too. And that's... Uh, and that's and that's, again, not what I say. That's what bin Laden says. That's what Zawahiri says. That's what all of them say, that Iraq isn't their ultimate goal. The United States of America is their ultimate goal. I, I think that's very hard to, to argue that because you just look at what, what they say. Um, of course, that comment of mine was uh, distorted. Life isn't fair, Jack Kennedy said. I was talking about after the war, American presence. I was talking about after the war, American presence. After the first Gulf War, where we kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, we entered into an, an agreement for American presence in Kuwait. After the Korean War, after the ceasefire, we arranged for American presence in Korea, and we've been there ever since. After a number of conflicts, Germany, Japan, a number of others, we have had American presence. So we will win the war, and we will win it fairly soon. And what I mean by winning is Iraqi military, Iraqi political, uh, social, economic process takes over. Americans withdraw to bases. Our casualties continue to, uh, to go down, and we will withdraw to the bases. And then, after the situation is largely under control, by the way, there will always be suicide bombers. Ask the Israelis. Ask the Israelis how hard it is to counter suicide bombers. But largely a situation under control where the military, political, and social process can move forward, like last New Year's Eve, where thousands of Iraqis pour down in the streets to celebrate the New Year in Baghdad for the first time in many, many years. And then we will decide on the uh, arrangement for American presence in Iraq. And whether that presence is like it has been with Germany since World War II, now uh, 45 from 08, uh, 50 some years, uh, then, then, um, then, then that, that is something that will be decided between the two countries, as we have military presence in many parts of the world. That's one of the things about being what the world superpower, is sometimes you have to help others maintain security in the world through a military presence. No American uh, argues against our military presence in Korea or Japan or Germany or Kuwait or other places or Turkey because Americans are not receiving casualties there. And I believe that once we win, which will be, when I say win, as I described it to you earlier, then we will decide on the security arrangement after the war is won. I hope that answers your question. And by the way, you're, go ahead and respond again. Obviously, you disagree. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, it just seems like you're still saying they could sleep on our couch as long as, as, long as they need to. Well, we're sleeping on the Koreans' uh, couch. We're the, the Koreans are sleeping on our couch. The Kuwaitis are. The Germans are. The Japanese are. Uh, and, and Americans, I think, are, think, generally speaking, we have a more secure world thanks to American presence, particularly in Asia, by the way, as we see the rise and influence of, of China. But... The key to it is American casualty, America's most precious uh, asset, and that's American blood that has been sacrificed, and we can, and we've dramatically reduced that, and we can eliminate it over time and a relatively short period of time. I thank you, and I thank all of you for being here, and I thank you very much, Jim, for allowing me to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator McCain. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. The senator has an appointment in Fort Worth and Dallas. We could continue this all morning, but he's got to be in Fort Worth and Dallas. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Senator McCain, for being with us.